blessing that was. Uh, I probably said this many times, but I'll say it once more, more time. That's my dad's favorite song. And uh, I mentioned on Sunday how good it was to memorize hymns. And that hymn, especially day by day, um, every single verse rings in my head because my dad had us, we, we said it as a poem, we sang it as a song, we did, we, we did everything with that song. And so um, it's, in, it's etched in my mind and I, I praise the Lord for that. I didn't appreciate it when I was young, but I do appreciate it now. And I uh, praise the Lord for that. Thank you, um, Perkins, for that wonderful, beautiful rendition of Day by Day. By the way, I think, um, yeah, anything you can do to invest in memorizing those, especially young families, uh, it's amazing how quickly kids pick up things. And if you just go over it several times, uh, it really is something. All right, take your Bibles if you would. We've got a few moments here to look through the Word of God. We do have a business meeting tonight, just a brief one. So um, we'll, uh, we'll keep that in mind, but uh, we're going to look through something that God has laid on my heart, Psalm 130, if I didn't say it already, Psalm 130, and uh, from time to time uh, I'll be reading a psalm and it'll just strike me as something that is just full of truth. Now all of them are, but you know at some points in time we're more ready to receive God's word than others and um, that happened to me um, last week and then this week here in Psalm 130. And I did a little research. You know, Psalms are not as random. They're, they're, they seem to be random to us as far as their organization and their content and other things. But really, there's a lot of order to the Psalms, and I want to tell you a little bit about that tonight. Um, and I, I've just, I don't have a fancy title tonight. I've just entitled this Psalm 130. How about that? Um, but I just want to walk through this Psalm in a very um, just or, or orderly way and, and just talk about each verse tonight. And I'd like you to draw the same truths and comfort, uh, encouragement maybe, that I think God intends for us to find here and that I found as I was reading through it. And maybe it'll spur you to further study these things. And I would encourage you in that. Uh, maybe tonight this would be like, man, that is powerful. And if nothing else, maybe this will help you to learn how to study the Bible a little bit, how to take verses, not just read them, but then to go back and to look and see how... What, what does this mean? And in context, and then I can go over here and cross-reference, and I can, I can apply that by what I know through the New Testament. You know, there's a lot of things we know because we live in the age that we live in. The Bible says that, that Paul mentioned now the mystery has been revealed. And now we don't understand everything, but we know a lot more of God's plan than the Old Testament prophets did. And uh, they saw it in a, in a kind of in a fog almost. Um, some things were very clear. But we can see the plan of God already. Now we could use that, that paradigm, that focus, and we could look back through that lens at the Old Testament. And boy, I tell you, there's just so much richness that comes because of that that we can glean as we look back. So I encourage you to, to not just look at what the Word of God can do and speak to your heart and how that verse talks to me, but, but look at how it is in the, in the really the, the lens of understanding through the New Testament. So... Um, I'd like to read it, and uh, you just follow along uh, if we can. There's only eight verses. It's a very short one. Um, Psalm has has the distinction. Psalms has the distinction of having the longest chapter in the Bible, which is good. Just making sure you're awake here. All right, and then it also has uh, the very short ones. Uh, Psalm 118, uh, 17 maybe the shortest one. I think there's only two verses or three verses in those. But um, so so they come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes. Uh, and they have a lot of different um, topics, and uh, some of them are uh, what, what are known as, um, um, the word skips me, dealing with a coming Savior, messianic, that's the word I'm looking for. Some are penitentiary, that, that's not a place you go for um, <laughs> crimes, but the idea is you're penitent, you're, you're remorseful for sin, a lot of those We'll deal with that. Some were called songs of ascent. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Let's, let me read. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Verse 1, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. <clears throat> that phrase, out of the depths, starts very low. No pun intended. That's, that's the lowest you can go. Matter of fact, the title in Latin for this psalm was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, literally de profundis, that is, at the very bottom, in the depths, at the very bottom. All right, go on. Verse 2, Lord, hear my voice. 
let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. So much truth in those two verses. Verse 5, I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. Verse 6, my soul waiteth for the Lord. He repeats that. And then he goes on and says, more than they that watch for the morning. I say, more than they that watch for the morning. You think he's trying to get a point across here. Now, it's a song, obviously, we know. But, but this is very true. Verse number 7, let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Now, one this is one of the 15 psalms that were known as the Songs of Ascent. As the Jewish males, sometimes with their families, would come to Jerusalem uh, for the feast days, this was something that was required of them. They would come, and as they approached it, everything in, in Israel was, when you're going towards Jerusalem, was considered to be up. Okay, When you're going to Jerusalem, it was considered to be up. When you're coming away from Jerusalem, it was considered to be down. So you would always be going down from Jerusalem, always up to Jerusalem. So when they saw, uh, sang a song of ascent, the idea was that as they would come close and they would begin to get a glimpse of the holy city on the roads coming in, they would begin to sing one of these 15 songs. Now, they, would, they ranged from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134, and those songs were songs that were sung in expectation. Some of them, uh, just uh, th you can read through them, they... they uh, Sometimes they were, again, penitent. Some of them were hopeful. Some of them were um, just looking forward to what would happen. But all of them de dealt with that matter of coming to Jerusalem, preparing their hearts. By the way, there's something to be said about preparing your heart to come before the Lord. And they did that. It, you can imagine how exciting it was to come on these feast days to the main city where all of the people would be gathered. But they always came prepared in their heart. Now, I'm not saying every person, but that was the intent uh, they wanted to be prepared. So singing helped them with that. And these songs were very traditional, uh, traditionally sung like that. Matter of fact, Jesus and his disciples uh, very likely were singing some of these songs as they would come up for different feast days in Jerusalem there. Uh, very interesting. Now, also, <clears throat> it it's, uh, begins very low. I said that in the depths. And it ends very high, right? So in that way, it could be a song of ascent as well. You're starting very low coming out very high on, on, in the sense of what the truth was that he was dealing with there. It's also one of the seven songs, and I mentioned this, one, it's called one of the s seven songs of um, a penitence or penitential songs. It's a, really a, a, the idea of the Spirit was, listen, I understand my sin, I understand what's going on, and I recognize my state before God. And that was really the spirit by which it was written. And I was interesting in a historical note, this particular song was one that God used to draw uh, John Wesley to salvation. Uh, the Bible, or I mean, the history tells us that John Wesley had been talking to Martin Luther and he had read this song especially. And, um, uh, excuse me, that's not true. Martin Luther was earlier on. I'm, I got, I'm, two, two stories are colliding here. But Martin Luther was also greatly affected by this song. All of a sudden, the historical timeline in my mind just didn't make sense. Um, <laughs> But the fact is that John Wesley had gone into uh, one of the churches there in London, and when he, when he got in there, the choir was actually singing this song that had been written. Okay, here's where it was. I think the song was written by Martin Luther. That's what it was. And uh, they were singing this song. It was basically a paraphrase of this, but when they got to that phrase that said, Who, um, oh, oh uh, verse number nine, If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? And, and he said to himself, John Wesley said, there's no way I can stand before the Lord except I'm guilty. And it, it struck him in such a way that God used that really to, for his conversion. Now, he was religious, but he was converted, I believe, after hearing that psalm. So it's a very powerful song, very, very, what, excuse me, very much one that had been effective down through the ages of history, especially church history. So it's very interesting. But as I was reading, I just got thinking about how much truth there is. And let's just walk through this. First of all, I mentioned out of the depths. Now, usually if you think of depths, you think of something especially that's been covered over. And, and you think about something that's down underneath the depths, and you're not going to hear 
what's under there, right? I mean, usually it's buried and, and you're not going to hear it. But what's interesting to me is David or the psalmist, whoever this is, is saying, um, boy, I am under the depths. I am down in the depths. And even though it's over top of me, I'm crying unto the Lord. And the amazing thing is that his trust is that God will hear him because he says there, uh, the, the cries of the heart, the, the cry that he wanted to, for God to hear was something that he gave, even though he was completely overwhelmed by his situation. But notice in verse number two, Lord, hear my voice. Now, here's what I thought about this. It's enough for this psalmist to trust that if God could just but hear his voice, I could just depend upon him. I could trust him. Now, hear me. Too many times we feel like, man, I want God to hear my voice and I want him to have some sort of interaction. I want some sort of answer. We understand God is a hearing God. Can I tell you, when God hears us, he knows our plight. He knows what we're going through. He hears our prayer and especially our cries. There's no doubt about it. And I, I know that in the depths of this person's heart, the cry went out. And he said, Lord, if I can just know that you hear me. And boy, the, the blessing is tonight that I can say, because of what we understand, our relationship with God, he does hear us. Now, here's why that's important. Because it was enough for him that he knew that God could hear him. He doesn't concern himself with what God might say. He's not anxious about what God may do. He just simply expresses the desire, Lord, if you'll just hear me. Now, I think that's very much part of our DNA. We just want to be heard. Now, oftentimes that leads us to do things that, you know, maybe aren't good, especially kids. Uh, little kids, you know, they want attention uh, and they'll do all kinds of stuff. Um, I, I have a couple kids. I, I hate to keep going back to my, my bus route, but I, I have a couple kids that just love attention. And uh, one in particular, he just thinks it's very fun, little, little first grader to just pretend like he's asleep when everybody else gets off the bus. And he makes me walk all the way to the back and, you know, get him up and, you know, put on his book bag and kind of shoo him out. Why? He just loves that attention. He smiles the whole time with his eyes closed. And I'm just like, you know, and, and so what I'm saying is he just likes to be seen. He likes to be heard. And I think that's really innate in all of us, right? Now, we don't all have that, that brash personality sometimes, but I'll tell you right now, it's something for us that we be heard. And I'll tell you right now, as a child of God, God hears us. Now, he, he sees us. He knows. He understands. And, and I'm not saying that God does everything we want him to do because if he did, he wouldn't be God. But I'll tell you this, he hears. And when there is a cry, especially a cry of penitence, a, a cry of remorse and repentance, let me tell you, God hears that. And he knows when our hearts are overwhelmed. Now, we could apply this to anything. I don't know for sure that this is dealing with um, sin especially. Now, there's other times we know he talks about iniquities and transgressions and other things. It's very possible that this was part of David's uh, sorrow when he, after his sin. We, we always attribute Psalm 51 to David in that time, but this possibly could be that. There are many other ways or things that we could attribute this to but what I'm saying is it definitely is applied to sin but it could also be just when is your depth or, or your soul in the depths I mean when there's trouble when there's difficulty when there's trials that overwhelm us let me tell you right now David I keep referring to David the psalmist here was ready and willing to cry out to the Lord he cried out to the Lord can I tell you tonight that God wants us to cry out to him when his disciples were in trouble they cried out to the Lord when the thief on the cross understood his plight, he cried out to the Lord. When, uh, when P Peter was sinking in the water, he cried out to the Lord. I'm saying that when we're in trouble, it makes sense for us to call out to the one who we know will hear us. And it will suffice us then to realize that he does hear us. It's not that we have to hear from him right away. I don't have to have the answer. I don't have to know everything. I don't have to understand what you're going to do. All I need to know is that you hear me. And I think that's the blessing of the truth here, is that he hears us. It's sufficient that he knows that God hears him. And this, I believe, really is a truth that we could learn from. The question tonight I would ask you is, are we content to know that God hears what we cry from our hearts? Then, do we trust him enough to accomplish his plan through it? 
Do we trust him enough to do what he says? Now, we'll come back to this theme because it's not done yet. Matter of fact, he makes a very clear statement in just a minute. But it, I see something that's missing here, and that is any claim to worthiness or merit on his part. He's not saying, Lord, hear me because of me. Hear me because, or I, I've done this, so Lord, you need to hear me. No, it's completely thrown at the mercy of God. Lord, I just want to know that you hear me. And I want to encourage you tonight. Whatever your heart cry is, and I'm talking about a genuine, sincere trial and overwhelmed feeling, that depth of feeling, whether it be sin or some other situation, understand that God hears the cry. Now, he goes then to, I think, something that really is an amazing thought to us tonight. Now, we take for granted the fact that God has forgiven our sins, right? I mean, I grew up, I was thinking about this uh, today as I was doing some study. I grew up in a church. Uh, my dad was a preacher, and I heard it all the time, and I understand. It's just part of my DNA to trust that God forgives sins. I mean, I know no other thing. I, I don't know anything else. Now, there was a time when I had to come to the point where I had to accept what Christ did for me, but it's just so easy for me to rest in the fact that God has forgiven my sins. And I have to really work to keep my heart tender to the fact that, man, God forgave my sins. Now, there's a balance there. But boy, I tell you, this is something that he points out. I love this. And we can look back again through, this, through the eyes or, or through the lens of the New Testament that we know now and understand what David was talking about. But he says here in verse number 5, oh, excuse me, verse 3, Thou, O Lord, if thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? How many of you have read that before and realized, you know, I really resonate with that? Now, it's easy for us to assent to it doctrinally. I mean, listen, there is not one person tonight, and I cannot give this the time that it deserves tonight, but there is not one person tonight that would say, I deserve to stand before the Lord in some merit of my own when we realize what God has done and who we are. There's just no way. And so we resonate with this. Dave, or the, the psalmist is feeling this. Listen, if God were to mark iniquities, is there any person who'd be able to stand? The answer, obviously, is a rhetorical one, but it's absolutely none. There is none that would be able to stand before the Lord if he would count our iniquities. Now, does this mean tonight that God doesn't see our sin? Well, I would say Nahum chapter 1, verse 3 says, The Lord is slow to anger and in great power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind, in the storm, and the clouds are to the dust of his feet. Verse 4, he rebuketh the sea, and maketh it dry, drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, and Carmel, and the flower of Le Lebanon languisheth. Verse 5, the mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world, and all that dwell therein. Here's what they're saying. Does God see the evil in the world today? And the answer is yes. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro beholding the evil and the good. So God does see that. So how in the world can we, can we justify this truth that God doesn't mark iniquities, but yet He sees all of that goes on? Well, the understanding there is on the opposite side, He is rich in mercy. Now, I've, I've spoken on this before. I won't belabor this tonight, but listen to these verses. Psalm 86 and verse 5. The Bible says, For thou, O Lord, thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. All right? Isaiah 55, 7, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. He will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Psalm 59, 16 and 17, I will sing of thy power, yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning. For thou hast been my defense and my refuge in the day of trouble. Unto thee, O my strength, will I sing. For God is my defense and the God of my mercy. God of my mercy. Now, here's, here's what I'm talking about tonight. On one side, we have the God who is rich in mercy. On the other side, we have a God who sees all. How in the world can these two things come together? Can you answer that tonight? Say it. Only God, but by what, what method, what, what plan? The Lord Jesus. Okay, now, so here's, here's the whole point. This is how we can see this through the eyes of the New Testament. The Lord Jesus, the Messiah, God himself, took 
the justice of God and the mercy of God and brought it together in such a way that we could be presented with it. Now, this is beautiful. The psalmist is singing this and saying, this is a wonderful thing. Matter of fact, as we get to the end, he shall redeem Israel from her or his iniquities. Now, what I'm saying is, this was prophetic in the sense that now we see what we have. We have not only a God who sees all, but is a God of mercy, and that comes together in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's what you and I have. We have that gift. Praise the Lord for that. So what, what is this mercy that he's rich in? Well, verse 4 teaches us, all right? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. So that, that's the story of Jesus. There is forgiveness with thee. The forgiveness that God gives us now is bringing this psalmist who is in the depths and he is rising out by truth. Listen, there is uh, it's terrible, Lord, if you mark my iniquities, how in the world could I stand before you? Who can stand? By the way, the word mark there is the idea of keeping track. If I, if I was held accountable for all those things, there's no way, right? We, we sing about the debt that we owed that we can never pay and, and the debt that Christ paid that he didn't owe. And I praise the Lord that that debt has been forgiven. It's been given, completely expunged, not just by a swipe of God's hand, but by the very death of Jesus on the cross. All right, so that's, that's the blessing of it. Now, there's forgiveness with thee. Now, notice in that last phrase, verse number four, that thou mayest be feared. Now, talk to me a little bit here. I want to help us to just see this. How in the world does forgiveness of God contribute to what the Bible says is the fear of God? Now, before we say what we think here, um, we must define fear of God as being what? Reverence, awe, respect, okay, that God deserves. Okay, so God is obviously set up on something, so we look to Him with reverence and, and awe. Okay, so how does God's forgiveness, forgiveness lead to that fearing of God? Help me out. There's a, there's a logic here we have to use to come to that. Okay, yeah. She said humility, gratitude, that's true. But, but in what way? Think with me, really think with me tonight. How does it contribute? Okay, maybe we can think of it backwards. Dennis, go ahead. Sounds to me like who he is. He's forgiven. Okay. That's, that's true. That's right. Think of it the opposite way. Think of it if God had not given us forgiveness or there was no provision of forgiveness. Okay, if God hadn't done that. Would there be anything that sets him apart... Would there be anything that we would respect and awe and reverence Him for? And I would say to you, the answer is no, because obviously we don't have a God if we don't have redemption. We don't have a God if we don't have forgiveness. So what sets Him apart is that forgiveness. In other words, we have a God who has condescended to man, and therefore it's that very forgiveness that He's given to us that sets Him apart so that all the world can say, when they trust that and they accept that forgiveness that God gives, they can say, wow, God is to be feared. In other words, it sets him apart as the God of gods, the, the Lord of lords, and there is none like unto him. There is nobody else that's done that. That's what it's talking about. Lord, there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. I love the fact that Christians, when they come to that realization... And by the way, tonight, can I tell you that whether you realize it or not, when you got saved, you were given an, the ultimate gift, and that gift needs to be unpacked, it needs to be understood, you need to grow in that, right? I use the illustration of when I was married, uh, you know, I, I, I thought I loved my wife, I told my wife I loved her, and I loved her, I think, to the fullest that I could at that point, but my capacity grew as my knowledge grew, and same with you. Right, And the same as with when we're saved, you have that small little understanding and faith and you're like, oh man, this is exciting, it's great, I love God. And you love Him as much as you can, but as you grow in your knowledge, now it becomes more and more apparent what God has done. And you just unpack that more and more. And, and I'm saying tonight that as a Christian, when you stop growing in knowledge, you will not understand 
the fear of God. Because you, th that forgiveness that God has given to you somehow doesn't seem as valuable. So the forgiveness of God really is about setting Him apart in our minds to fear Him so that we might uh, respect and awe Him, worshiping Him, etc. Now, we're, and I said this, but, but were it not for redemption, what would we worship God for? And I would say that you know, He would be no different and again, I'm, this is impossible, so it's hypothetical, but I'm just saying redemption, forgiveness is what sets God, our God, apart. He condescended, He gave us forgiveness through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's huge. It's huge. All right, so look at verse number five now. We'll quickly go through the rest. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in His word do I hope. Now, I, I, lured, uh, uh, um, excuse me, I alluded to this earlier on, but he kind of makes a huge point here. I wait for the Lord... And in his word do I hope. We come back to this theme that is struck in the first couple verses. The fact of the trust that he expresses in God. He says, I wait. Have you ever waited before? <laughs> we all have. Uh, I mean, you've waited today. Uh, whatever it might be. A and sometimes that waiting can be very difficult. How many know waiting is really a mental game more than anything else? Okay. Because waiting uh, is really about, okay, give me some, give me some uh, synonyms of the word wait that come to your mind? Who is it? Patience, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're not very good at this, are we? We don't know much about waiting here. Okay, waiting, in my mind, is, is just calmness, expectation, right? Steady, we're, we're um, patient, I guess those all things come to mind. Okay, so when, if, if I say I'm waiting for something, there's an expectation of that coming to pass that I'm settled into. I'm just, I'm not doing anything uh, to, to, to distract or take that away. I'm just waiting. That's coming. Okay, now, listen. Um, if, I'm, if I'm discontent or if I become distracted or, or if I become, uh, in a sense, agitated, am I, am I really waiting? And the answer is no. I've become um, impatient. And I want to point that out to you because waiting is very important. It's a mental aspect of our Christian life that we have to exercise. Now, here it is. He's in the depths of his trouble. He's crying out to the Lord. He, he's confident that the Lord will hear him. He's recounting the goodness of God. And then he says, I'm going to wait. In other words, whatever I need from you, I know that it's going to come. But I'm going to wait for it to come. I'm not going to allow it to distract me. I'm not going to allow myself to become impatient. I'm not going to allow myself to get off track. I'm not going to allow myself to do anything but just wait on the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean you sit there with your arms crossed, but it does mean you're expecting help from Him, and if I could say, not from anything else. Now, do you exercise that kind of waiting on the Lord? Now, he emphasizes this. He doesn't just say it once. He says, he goes on and he says in verse number 5, I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in His word do I hope. Now, I'm going to talk about that last phrase, of course, in just a minute. But um, from Him, in other words, I expect relief and comfort, believing that it will come, longing till it does come, but patiently bearing the delay of it. Now, there's the problem. I'm longing for it to come, but I'm patiently waiting and bearing the delay. How many of us could really do that? Man, I tell you, sometimes we're just like, Lord, I'm done. I'm not going to do this. I'm, I'm going to just, I've got to find some other relief. No, waiting for the Lord. Resolving to look for it for no other hand, no other source. I wait for Him in sincerity, not just in my words, but I'm expectant, and it is for the, the Lord that my soul waits. All right, so the confidence then is this. Verse number five in, in the last part, in His Word do I hope. This is really the key, isn't it? Your, your patience and your waiting have to be settled in the time of calamity, the time of distress, the time of great need. Your soul is buried. All right? Where do you get that kind of confidence and hope? It has to be His Word. And can I say tonight, okay, how many of us, that's the first thing that goes? Man, it's so hard, isn't it? The very person we're supposed to be trusting and hoping in and waiting on, his word is what we neglect first. 
His, his word is what gives us the confidence to hope. In his word do I hope. Listen, that's the key. That's where you've got to be. That's the kind of spirit that gives the strength and courage to carry on. And so that confidence that he had from the word of God is so important. Those that do not hope cannot wait. But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it, the Bible says. God's word is a true word, but sometimes there is a delay. It waits, it tarries. We don't have what we want. If ours is true faith, then it will wait on the Lord and his time. The word from the Lord is as bread to the soul of the believer and gives the strength that we need. Listen, I cannot emphasize this enough, church. If you are in difficult times and waiting on God, you must have confidence through his word. You must. That's the only place. But pastor, I don't feel it. I don't understand it. Listen, waiting on God is difficult, but it comes because of the strength through his word. And then he goes on in verse number 6 and says it a little bit more. My soul waiteth for the Lord. And then he gives you a little bit of a comparison. More than they that watch for the morning. Then he repeats it. I say, more than they that watch for the morning. Okay, now, who watches for the morning? Who? Maybe soldiers, right? They're They're at the gate and they're sentinels for the night. They've got a night watch. They're watching, waiting. Why? Because when the morning comes, oh, now I can see. It's not so scary. How many of you have laid in bed waiting for the morning? (laughs) You know, many, many parents, moms of sick kids have waited for the morning, right? Just with that, once that sun comes up, it just seems to be so much better. How many, how many, um, we understand watching, waiting for that morning just seems to bring hope. It just seems to bring something there. And just as much as people wait for the morning, they wait to see that sunrise, they're earning, yearning for it, they're watching for it, they're expecting it. He says, more than they, I am waiting on the Lord. Whew. What a testimony. Now, I don't know that that was what he was feeling right then, but that was his commitment. I'm waiting on the Lord. Listen. I'm telling you right now, whatever the situation is, the hardship, the difficulty, your soul is in the depths. God hears that cry from the heart, even though it's buried by the depths. And listen tonight, it doesn't matter if he moves immediately or later on. You can be assured that he's heard you and that he is working and that you can trust him and your confidence and hope comes from God's word and you're going to be steadfast and waiting for him more than they that watch for the morning. Praise the Lord. And so he goes on, verse number 7, Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. Now he applies this to those that should know better, right? That know him. Israel had all that she needed or he needed to hope in the Lord. Let's count what he needed to hope in the Lord. He he needed God's word. He had that. He, he, uh, He needed God himself. Jehovah was Israel's God. He had Jehovah. He had everything he needed to trust the Lord and to, and to wait patiently for him. And so, that hope, the same is true for us this evening. Have you thought, why did God bother to put all of this in the Bible for us? Can I tell you why? The answer is that he did it so that we can learn from the way that he did things and we can grow in it. If Jehovah was God, Israel's God, And God's word was the confidence that Israel needed. The psalmist said, let Israel hope in God. And I would say that the same is true with us. If God, if Jehovah is our God, how many would say Jehovah is our God? Amen. How many would say then, we have God's word for us today? Amen. If we have God's word and we have the very God of that word, Can I say tonight, let Broadview Heights Baptist Church hope in God. The same same equation, the same ingredients that Israel had to whereby the psalmist could say, let Israel hope in God. The fact that he doesn't count our iniquities, the fact that he is rich in mercy, the fact that we can trust him and he hears us, let us hope in God. And my admonition, my burden for you tonight is, Hope in God as you wait for Him. 
You say, what does that mean, Pastor? Well, it means that you're in a difficult time. You're, you're crying out. Your depths, you're in the depths. You know God hears. You know God's working. I can't see it. It feels like He doesn't, but we know He is. Wait on God. Hope in Him. Hope in His Word. Find something that you can stand on and stand on it. Verse number 8, He shall redeem Israel from all His iniquities. I love that hope. Yes, Israel would be redeemed and will be redeemed from all His iniquities. And that, I believe, is yet to come as a whole, the nation. But may I say tonight that God answered that individually for each one of us. We have that on an individual level. Now, he was praying for a nationwide redemption and we're looking forward to that. That was their hope. And by the way, the people were saved the same way we could be saved. We're saved today. But I'll just tell you tonight, we have the same foundation that David or the psalmist was, was standing on as he was praying this prayer and singing this song. And that foundation is God and His Word. Now, the application, I'm going to leave you with this. We're done. What is your soul in the depths of tonight? Now, it feels like it overwhelms. And normally, when things are in the depths, the sound is covered up, right? And we can't hear anything. But God hears the cry, even from the depths. All right? So the good news is, you can trust that God will hear you. And you can trust that when He hears you, He is working. I don't know what the answer will be. I don't know what the timeline will be, but He's working. You can trust that. Now, here's how, we have, here's how we have the strength to have patience to wait on Him. Find the Word of God that God uses through your study, through whatever it might be, and grasp onto that. That's your hope. That, that simply means, Lord, there's a, there's a verse, there's a promise, there's, there's a truth, there's a principle that I'm claiming by faith in my time of difficulty and this is giving me the strength to go through and to wait patiently for you. Have you ever had that before? If you haven't, you need to experience that. Now, sometimes we come to a place of decision in our lives. I've got to turn left or turn right or go straight. I've got to, I've got to make a decision. I don't know what to do. Listen, we hope in God and we hope in His Word. Let God's Word direct you. Uh, maybe, maybe you're overwhelmed by an emotional physical, financial, relational, whatever it might be, spiritual need. Maybe sin, some sin has got its grip on you. Out of the depths, you can cry and God will hear. Now, you don't need to wait for God to cleanse you. You can find forgiveness today. That deliverance, maybe, maybe the end of the story, whatever it is that you're looking for, you wait on God and let God deal with it. Let God do it in His time. And I believe God wants us to learn this. You know, th there's so much we can learn from this, but I'm thankful tonight for the truths that we can learn from Psalm 130. If God would number or mark our iniquities, who could stand before Him? Praise the Lord tonight. And I love the fact that it says, one more thing I didn't mention here, but there is forgiveness with God. I mean, in other words, that's His very nature. It's His very nature. It's who He is. Praise the Lord tonight. So I hope that you'll maybe take this, maybe this will become kind of a meditation point the next few days or whatever it might be. Psalm 130. Lord, just reveal to me things that I need to know. And if, if it's not something you need right now, when that time comes, that you do need it, and there will come a time, I believe God can help us to stand and, and have faith in Him. Lord, thank you tonight for your word. I thank you for your grace. And, and Lord, the, the testimony here. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be uh, mindful of the truth of it. Lord, guide us, I pray, as we go through difficult times. I'm, I'm mindful of many burdens that people bear, Lord, in our church tonight. And, and my heart is heavy for them. Lord, we can very easily come to a point where we give up on God or we somehow um, just, Lord, become very impatient and we look to other things for our hope or for our distraction to try to find some relief. But God, I pray that we might hope in God and in your word. Lord, I pray that you would guide us. We thank you for who you are. Thank you that there is forgiveness with God. And Lord, we thank you that we can trust you. I pray that you would bless now. Bless each heart. I pray that you would bless, Lord, each need tonight.